We're so excited to be back in chapel again tonight to hear from Dr. Deneff again as he continues his message on holiness. Would you stand with us as we worship tonight?
to be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. We sang this song this morning. Um, we're singing it again tonight because of the meaning that it holds. This meaning that we should want to have Jesus in our heart with for the love that he had for those who had nothing. So I encourage you to sing, or I encourage you as you sing this next song to take a posture of what God is calling you to do, not of yourself. them a home, adopting the unwanted, and calling them your own. Make us like you, Lord. Oh, give us your heart. Oh, give us your heart. Let the light of heaven shine as we step into the dark.
process it's been like the Lord saying to me like this is the result of the prayer you prayed and it's easy to look that in a ne- look at that in a negative light because there's a lot of hard it's a hard prayer to pray uh, the prayer of refining and refine me Jesus and it's a hard path to take because of all the sacrifices that it calls for and those sacrifices hurt and you're like I don't want this um, but as we become more like Jesus and as he gives us his heart and as we become made in his image, we'll see how those sacrifices that we made are worth it. And we see how that pain that we walk through and the pain that we experience in the sacrifice refined us into the beings that are in his image. And so when we pray, give us your heart. And when we sing about refining and when we sing about being more like Jesus, we have to acknowledge that that's a hard prayer and that's a hard path and that's a hard that's a hard sacrifice to make but in that we have to look at the fact that this is what we're called to and it's not nothing is wasted in that journey and it's easy to just sit and wallow in the despair and the hopelessness and the loss but we don't grieve like those who have no hope and we don't walk this journey without any promise at the end of the journey so that's been my encouragement through this process and even through these songs that we've been singing and I hope that the Lord reveals what he wants you to say from me. Oh, 
Say the statement that Job said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. I pray that you open our minds and our hearts to receive what it is you want us to receive from Dr. Deneff tonight as he comes and he speaks. We thank you for being in here and giving us this opportunity to gather in your presence. And it's in your beautiful name. I pray this. Amen.
Hello, this one worked. All right, I'm going to hop down real quick. But yeah, I just want to share a little bit of why we do this. Um, so this is a week that, that we get to come. We get to come. Do not make the mistake of saying we have to come here. We get to come here. We get to come to this space a few extra times to just you know, ponder and reflect on where God might be leading us, uh, whether that be to a, a more challenged, deeper commitment to him or a place of humility. But through all of that, he wants us to be more holy. It says, be holy as your father is holy. And so we get to come here and do that because we serve a God that is so big, but yet he invites us to come and to dwell with him. The creator of the universe, like we just sang, man, like everything bows in reverence to God. And if we don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. So this week, I just, my prayer and my hope, like every, every year we've had this, like I've been impacted. I've been shown a new way that, that God wants to, to work in my life, a new way that God is calling me deeper. And I pray that as this week progresses, that even though it's a short span, that we would, we would find the, the, I don't know, we would find the ability through Christ, through his power, to tune in, to, to listen to what he has. And yet at the same time, that we would just come here to just abide with him. That we would just come to be in his presence. Because that's what we need. We need more of Jesus. And so that's the heart of this week. That's why we take this time and do this this week. Second, I would like to take time to formally introduce our speaker. His name is Dr. Steve Deneff. He is the lead pastor at College Wesleyan in Marion, Indiana, and he has been serving in the Wesleyan Church, correct me if I'm wrong, for a little over 30 years, correct? A little over. And so we are just so thankful to have him here, taking time, traveling a ways to be with us. And so as he comes, would you just give it up for Dr. Steve Deneff? Thank you, brother. It's very nice. I'm going to sit on a stool tonight. Would that be all right? Oh, I've got to find a way to get out of your way. Um, everything I want to say tonight can be said in just a couple of verses, so let me start at the end. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he said that we are not children of the darkness. We are children of light, children of the day. In Romans 13, he said, the night is far gone and the day is already upon us. Put away then the things of the night and put on the armor of light. That's who we are. A few years ago, about the time our country was blowing up, uh, I decided to read the prophets. That was an experiment of sorts. I was, hadn't read them in a while in my personal time with God. And so I just decided that that would be my time. But this time I wanted to do it a little different. I decided to read the prophets uh, early in the morning. And then at night I would go online and I would read four or five different news sources to see what was happening. And as I did this, a couple of things became clear in the prophets almost immediately. The first is how relevant they are. I started reading the news in the evening, and in the morning I would go back into the prophets. And when I started, I was thinking, you know, I don't think these old guys really know what is happening in our culture. But I listen to them talk, you guys. 
And they spoke at things obliquely. They did not address the current issues of their day as if they were reacting to the news because they were saying things bigger than the news. They spoke of trends. So when Jeremiah, for instance, uh, said, they treat the wound of my people as if it isn't serious. Or when Ezekiel says, the priests are bowing down each to their own shrine. They're not speaking about a specific incident. They're speaking about a trend that's happening across their nation. And as I read it, I was about a week or two in, and I changed my mind. I started thinking, these guys are the only people who do know what is happening here. They are saying things about current events that no one in the country is saying, and they're talking about it at levels far deeper than anybody else. The second thing I noticed was how optimistic they were. I, how optimistic they were. I knew that the prophets came down hard on people. I was ready for that. But I was not ready for what Walt Brueggemann calls a prophetic imagination. They had the ability to imagine a future in language nobody else was using. When Jeremiah speaks about a righteous branch... When Isaiah speaks about a river running straight down a desert, they're speaking in metaphors that were full of imagery and pictures. And I thought, wow, whoa, nobody is this hard on a culture and a moment later this optimistic. And what made them optimistic is they envisioned a day when God was in charge of the world. They knew He was in control, but He wasn't in charge. Other people were in charge and they were wrecking things. But there would come a day, the prophet said, when God would be in charge of the world. And they started painting these pictures. That's when it occurred to me that we were missing something in all of the talk in America about speaking prophetically. Everybody was speaking about being a prophet. And what everybody said was, I'm speaking truth to power, as if that's the only thing prophets did. I'm going to go speak to people in power and take them down a notch and speak truth to power. But what they never did was reimagine another future when God was in charge. So I had some in my church that were in this truth to power gig, and I had a conversation with a couple of them. I said, uh, we are declaring a moratorium on speaking truth to power unless you can speak with a holy imagination describing what the world will be when God is in charge. If you can't do that, let somebody else speak truth to power. Because prophets do both. Are you there? So I want to introduce you to a prophet tonight. Uh, in keeping with what I said, I want to uh, talk about um, what the call looks like when you join something that is bigger than your ministerial career. I know everybody in the room right now is thinking, dude, I don't even know where I'm going to go in a year or two. I don't know if I'm going to have a job, man. I, you, you, first things first, brother. Get me a job in some church. And then we can talk about those big highfalutin things. But... <laughs> You understand, part of what churches are looking for is somebody who sees their job in a larger context. 
of the way that it feeds into something God is doing. And so if I can, um, I want to speak about that bigger context through the teachings of the prophet Micah. And I'm going to do the whole book tonight. Relax, it won't be that long. I know you're worried about it. I've compressed it. And if this goes well, um, we can get through it pretty quickly. I'm going to draw on the board in a minute. Uh, Micah is a contemporary of Isaiah. And he comes out guns blazing. He comes out saying that Israel is committed sins. Yahweh is coming from the mountain. Mountains are melting like wax before him. He says in chapter 1, verse 9, that Israel has an incurable disease. He goes on to say the incurable disease is that the land is defiled. You'll see in a moment that it's incurable because the people who were supposed to cure it themselves have the disease. The physician himself is sick. And so there is no way out of the dilemma. So at the beginning, when I'm going to draw Israel, if that's all right, there's Israel. Isn't that nice? At the beginning, Israel is covered over in a shroud of darkness because it is into things and the things it got into uh, has gotten into them and it started to pollute them. Some of the symptoms of this disease go throughout the book of Micah. And in fact, if you read other prophets, these symptoms occur in all of the prophets. Now the reason I list these, you guys, is so you can ask yourself, Oh man, do I see anything like that happening in our day? So as I list these things, don't just think about Israel, think about your country in this day. One of the things that the prophet says is happening economic injustice. But you probably haven't seen anything like that. He says in chapter 2 that they covet fields and they defraud people of their inheritance. So there's people in the country who are rich and powerful, and they're manipulating systems and laws to get more rich and powerful, creating an underclass that is poor and depressed, and the prophet has had it. Beyond that, he says, is the corruption of power. He says in chapter 2, they plot evil in the evening, and in the morning they do it because it is in their power to do so. He speaks about a religious hypocrisy. He talks about priests and prophets who teach and prophesy for money. He says the rulers except bribes, the priests teach for a price, and the prophets teach for money. And so there's this group of people that appear to be religious, but underneath it all, they have the same value system as the rest of the country. They're just cloaking it in a religious garb, but the value system is exactly the same. There's a problem, he says, with idolatry. In chapter 5, he talks about people bowing down to images, worshiping stones, worshiping things, he says, that they've made with their own hands. Now think about that. They're not worshiping something that is transcendent beyond the world. They're worshiping things in the world that they themselves have made. This is anything from money to success to positions to possessions. It's any number of things. This becomes their focus. This is all they think about. And to lose that is to lose everything. 
he goes on to say, there are false prophets. He'll say in chapter 3, if a prophet comes to you and he says, I will prophesy for beer and wine. He would be just the prophet you want. Because he will, that's, it's right in there, it's chapter 3. Because he would say things that you want to hear. And so there's a prophetic class who sounds religious, but they're only saying things that reinforces the value system of the status quo. Are you tracking yet? Beyond that, there is moral confusion. He speaks of God sending a darkness or a veil over the country. So people's morals begin to shift suddenly. Uh, they forget things that everybody knew 15 minutes ago. The entire value system is shot. Isaiah says they call good evil and evil good. They take what is sweet and make it bitter and take what is bitter and call it sweet. They say that darkness is light and light is darkness. There's a complete confusion in the country over what is right and wrong. I'll stop for a minute because this feels heavy, doesn't it? Now, in the last few things that I've drawn here, all of these things are affecting the country of Israel. Let me just pause for a second and ask, have you heard anything yet that sounds similar to what is happening in our country at this time? I'll wait. Now the problem, says the prophet, is there is an unholy trifecta that is at work. For want of better words, I'm clustering them together. These are the leaders, the religious, and the cultural elite. These are the big personalities. The leaders are the rulers and the judges. And they make laws that empower the rich and protect the religious. So the religious and the rich keep them in power and leave them alone. And then there are the religious. These are the moral teachers or the priests who teach for money and distort righteousness in the prophet's words. They distort what is good, the prophet says. And then there's the cultural elite. And these are the rich. Uh, these are the prophets. Uh, back in that day, prophets the prophets were a school Amos tells us this there were actually schools for prophets and prophecy was handed down from father to son so the son kind of grew up in his daddy's prophetic guild and learned the trade of prophesying but the more they prophesied the more popular they became and so if you were to compare the prophets in the Old Testament, the, I'm talking about the bad prophets, with the culture today, you would be talking about the rich and the famous, the people that have large followings, the ones that get lots of clicks, the ones who get quoted, and their tropes repeated. People were doing this all the time. I'll pause for a minute and ask again, are you seeing anything in your country now that resembles an unholy trifecta 
between the leaders who set laws, the religious people who broker a spiritual climate, and the cultural elite who set the trends for everybody. I'll wait. Now, what's worse is these three are, in what my mother used to say, cahoots with each other. There is no formal alliance. There's no sense in the book at which they're meeting and conspiring and saying, how do we take over Israel and make it our country? But if you step back and you look at the news, you would say to yourself, wait a minute, these people are working with each other informally because they need each other. The leaders need the religious to get and stay elected. And the religious need the leaders to create laws that give them room to manipulate. And the cultural elite need leaders and religious to validate everything that they're teaching. So they're not formally in an alliance with one another, but they need one another in order to survive. And the more they sort of collaborate informally, their power grows, and every one of these issues get harder and harder. Are you doing okay? The, the news gets better. Hang on. I found at the same time, you guys... That this, well, let me stop for a second. I haven't found, uh, I haven't found anything in the news that tells me what is going on like this. When I read this, I was like, holy cow. That's Hebrew for Amen. I stand back and I look at that and I just think, my goodness, these guys, why isn't anybody saying this? This is what's happening. And the reason it's an incurable disease is because the institutions that any civilization would normally look to to pull them out of that kind of confusion, those institutions are themselves full of that kind of stuff. When your nation is in turmoil, who do you look to? You look to the government and you look to the church. And both of those institutions are neck deep in moral confusion, religion, hypocrisy, idolatry, economic injustice. The leaders themselves are sick. So there is no cure. Close, I've been seeing this. The closest I've come to this, I'll say this, I think, I think I will, to the ministers in a couple days that I've come to this is um, some of the writings of a guy named Philip Reif, who is a sociologist, cultural critic, died 2006, was an expert on Sigmund Freud. But he had strong religious undertones. And Reef spoke of what he called the third culture. Can I take a minute and explain it? It'll take just a minute, but you'll start to see it. He said, civilizations tend to go through movements from first culture to second culture to third culture. The third culture is a culture of fate. It's where civilizations believe that there are supernatural gods, many of them, there are laws in place, and that humans or mortals must somehow reconcile with the divine, and they have all sorts of superstitions and methods and rituals to do that. But, but, but that's first culture. What happens in the second culture, he said, is these civilizations move from fate to faith. Faith is where they start to define the supernatural. This is who 
God is. He cited Judaism, Christianity, and Islam as three monotheistic religions that tried to put language and structure to deep, intrinsic feelings and longings. In the second culture, civilization is now trying to reconcile with a divine that is known in a way of salvation. Ours, of course, being the way of Jesus Christ. A third culture is what he calls an anti-culture. In a third culture, civilization is not trying to reconcile or justify itself on the basis of an external deity. They are doing it on the basis of themselves. It's what Peter Berger called the omnipotent self. The individual rises to be the center point of culture. And so what is accepted is what feels right and free and good to every individual. There is no ultimate being that we have to reconcile with. We have to find meaning within our own lives. And happiness in very personal, individualistic ways. And any attempt of religion or government to constrain the impulses of an individual in the third culture is seen as oppressive. Somebody said... Dr. Reef, where are we? He said, we are late second, early third. Then they said, how do we come back from that? He said, Oh, you don't. There is no back. And no civilization in the history of the world has survived third culture. It's not sustainable. You can't build civilization on it. I've taken enough time telling you how serious the day is in the words of Micah the prophet. Are you still with me? I get this. This is why I don't, I don't recommend you do this in the morning. It can be depressing at times. You wake up and this is the day the Lord has made. And an hour later you're like, oh. <laughs> but you guys, I found something else was happening in the book of Micah at the same time all of this stuff was happening. Yahweh, Almighty God, had found a way to counter everything that the prophet said was incurable. He has, as I say, a wild imagination. Listen to this. Right in the middle of the prophet, there's only seven chapters in the book, and right in chapter 4, listen to this imagination. Isaiah has the same vision. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and people will stream to it. that every religion in that day built their temples on mountains. They were high places. And the prophet is saying there is coming a day when every other religion in the world will look to the mountain of God and people will run like mad to be there. Many nations will come and say, 
Let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. And the law will go out from Zion, the word from the Lord, from Jerusalem. And then God Himself will judge between many peoples. He will settle our disputes. The ones between nations far and wide, such that they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nation will no longer take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war. Every man will sit under his own vine, under his own tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods. We will walk in the name of Yahweh, our God, forever and ever. Let it go. Oh, let the church say amen. And so when Micah hears this, when he sees this, he's like, this is amazing. How do I get into this, man? I mean, where do I sign up? You want me to take classes? You want me to do a mission trip? You want me to teach something? Maybe I'll be a professor. And then, Yahweh gives him an answer that starts in a whisper and it grows as the book continues. And that answer is that just as there is one culture who does all of this, there will be another culture that God himself will form called a remnant. This is an amazing vision. I'll tell you why. Because everybody in Micah's day was doing the same thing that they're doing in ours. They're saying, you're right, man, the place is shot full of holes. We got an unholy trifecta who's bringing everybody down. We're going to fix this. And one of the ways we're going to do it is a revolution. We're going to get the weak and depressed into the street. They're going to have a riot, and they're going to force the powerful to look at us, and we will not go away until they change the laws. Sound like anything? Some were saying, no, 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 we don't need that. We need a reformation. No, we need new laws. We need new leaders who are conservative, who have our values, who do our bidding. Let's get our guy elected. And if we can do this, we will rewrite the norms of this culture. The problem is Israel, like your country, is too diverse. No one's going to take it. And some people are saying, no, no, there needs to be a revival. We just need God to come down and settle the mess and deal with everything. Man, I don't know what we're going to do. Just come, fix it. Some were saying, no, we need the Messiah to come. He'll come and fix it what Christians would call a return, a second coming. Turns out, all four of these camps were active in Micah's day. But what the prophet said was, God has something entirely different in mind. God is going to form a small community within the nation. Listen to the description of this. He says, I will gather all of you and bring together the remnant of Israel. Chapter 2, verse 12. And then He will go up before them. And He, that is God, will break open the way. Chapter 2, verse 13. I will gather the lame and the disenfranchised and the misfits and I will put them together in a remnant. Chapter 4, verse 6. And there will be a leader in front of the remnant who will come from a little village called Bethlehem. Are you getting the hang of this stuff? 
Keep reading chapter 5, verse 7. This remnant will be in the midst of many people. Chapter 5, verse 8. The remnant will be among nations. The remnant will not be another community over here that's trying to steal people into a religious colony or sect. I'm going to do it right within the very nation that is incurably sick. Amos, or Micah says, I'm in. I'm in. What do you want? Yahweh says, you know what I want. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with God. You want to fix this? It doesn't happen with one sudden swooping return, not even of your Messiah. It doesn't happen with a massive Holy Ghost revival. It doesn't happen with better leaders. And it sure isn't a revolution. All revolutions for justice do is create other victims. That's all they do. They move the problem around. They take the oppressed and elevate them at the cost of someone else who now thinks they're a victim. And the culture plays whack-a-mole for a long time they can't find a way to get all the injustices down revel you can't get them all down because one rises at another's expense all the time you need another plan and he says there's a remnant who's going to do it i'm drawing a venn diagram they are those who love justice those Well, justice, mishpat, it simply means to step into a situation where there is oppression, where people are being held back, and in an act of justice, you intervene and you make things right again. It turns out justice is the proper use of power and privilege. If you have it, own it, That's what you're supposed to do with it. You're not to run around feeling ashamed about it. You're to sanctify it and then turn it loose on the injustices that are in this world. That's what mishpat means. Mishpat is in the Hebrew inescapably relational. It does what is required in each relationship. So it, what justice is varies from situation to situation because the relationships are different from situation to situation. You have to get in the situation to know what is wrong in order to apply what the Hebrews call justice. This is why governments can't bring justice. They don't know people. It is relational in nature. It is not just legislative. And that is all. I'm not being critical of the government. Governments aren't built for that. So I'm not running them down. I'm simply saying you can't ask a government to do what they're not built to do any more than you can ask a fish to climb a tree. They just don't have the apparatus. There must be mercy, or the Hebrew word is chesed. It means loving kindness, faithfulness, allegiance, loyalty to a person. If justice is the action 
love or chesed is the motive. And finally he said, there must be, uh, I'm really struggling for words here, I'm going to call it um, uh, inattentiveness to God. Uh, this word, walk humbly with God, it means in Hebrew, lowly, self-effacing, but it also means inattentiveness. So when you're walking humbly with somebody, you're in stride with them, paying attention to what they are doing at the time. Are you there? I'm almost done. Are you still there? A couple of observations. One is in the Old Testament. This is holiness. Holiness is not simply a consecration. Holiness is a righteous life that practices justice, loyalty, or faithfulness within its vows and a humble attentiveness to God in the walk of That's holiness. In the Old Testament, when one repents, this is what they do. They don't just feel sorry for sin. They actually change their lifestyle and start living toward justice and loyalty and humility. One last observation. What we are called to be, the remnant of God, is not any one of these three. It is all of these things. Do you know what happens if you practice one of these without the other? Watch, pay attention. If I practice justice without love or humility, it's not justice, it's revenge. It's activism. If I practice love without justice and holiness, it's only pity. Sympathy. If I walk humbly with God, but I do not practice justice in the walk of my life, it's only piety or conservatism. Holiness is the practice of justice for people that are marginalized. It is the practice of loyalty in the vows that we have made and to the organizations that we belong to. And it's the practice of humility. I... I, It just feels to me, you guys, that a lot of what I saw in the last three to four years, I'm just speaking about my country now. Speaking about um, the anger over the lockdowns, the whole stuff about George Floyd, the arguments about free and fair elections, the assault on our capital, the surge at the border, the crime in our major cities, the spike in homelessness and mental illness. It's all of it. And it just felt like our culture just kept throwing shallow answers at a very complex problem. And then one day, in the company of Micah, I heard the Lord say, this will take a long time, but you can do this. It is not too hard for you. It is within your reach. 
what I want to know tonight is are you in? This is not a message that you can satisfy in a night. It's not one that you you make a decision in there. You've you've done that. This is a lifetime. This country and this world is in desperate need of a remnant that lives an alternative community. One that is powerful and quiet, but irresistible, magnetic, because it's so attractive to people who are caught in the web. I just want to know, do you want to be part of that community? Band's going to lead us in a song. And I want you only if you're in. Take a while, think about it. Maybe you'll say, I'll decide sometime later. But if you're one who will say, no, man, this is going to be hard. And it's not heroic. But um, there's no other way. God's putting together a remnant right now. And I want in on it. I'm going to be part of something or I'll make it myself that brings justice and loyalty and humility back to the world. But God knows I'm in with all my heart. If that, if and when you're ready, just join the band by standing, okay?
pray for I pray I pray I pray for the kids I, I, I'm sorry for the word um, that are in the, 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 the audience right now some are afraid of what happens after school and some are feeling really inadequate and some might say I've got baggage and I don't have this or that there's so many reasons in this room, Father, that would compromise what you want from our lives. What I ask for in Jesus' name is that you would liberate us from those things. Set us free and call us into something that is bigger than our own lives and help us to give ourselves recklessly toward those things that you are already doing. Father, I would rather they fail at something that will succeed than succeed at something that won't matter. So I pray for them. Empower them. Lift them up. Give them courage and vision opportunity give them altars along the way where you meet them and heal them and set them free again by the power of your name and only for your sake in Jesus name God's people said amen thank you thank you for letting me pray with you Thank you for being here. Are you going to lead us in another song? Or do you... Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. The next song we're going to sing is Driven by Love, and it's talking about how God is calling us to step out of our comfort zone and to do something bigger for Him, 
for his glory, for his kingdom.
God, call us wherever you want us to go. Whatever it takes to make your kingdom known. Whatever it takes to glorify your kingdom, to glorify your name. God, if that means that you have to refine us, and even though that can be painful, and it can be hard, and it can be tough, God, remind us that you are taking the impurities off of us, and you are making us pure. God, remind us that it's not about our own ministries, but it's about what you have called us to. And God, remind us that that can even be something that we're not passionate about, but it is for your kingdom and for your glory. God, allow us to stand out in a dark world, to be a light to your name, for your name. God, allow us to have that moment where people ask us why we're different or why we stand out and allow us to have the courage to say because we know you and because we know your love God whatever it takes for your name to be glorified give us the strength to do so no matter where or no matter what we have to do God, remind us that you have called us to so much more. And what a privilege it is that we get to know you and that we get to know your son. And we get to know that he died for our sins. God, be with us as we go from this service. with us as we leave, as we process what we've learned, what, even what you have told us, God, by your spirit. God, may we, may we not forget this moment, this feeling that we had. We love you so, so much. And we lift this up in your wonderful holy name. Amen.